Hi guys, and welcome back for another round of Quarantine Conversations. Last week, we spoke with artist Caitlin Hereford about how to stay creative during stressful seasons. And if you weren't able to tune in live, you can catch the replay of our entire conversation over on our blog, coldboxfilms.com slash blog. It was a really great conversation. Caitlin shared some awesome insights. So if you weren't able to tune in, definitely hop over there and go check it out. This week, we're talking about virtual events. Due to the pandemic, many organizations have had to transition what would be in-person events to now be online experiences, which begs the question, can virtual events be just as meaningful and impactful and engaging as an in-person one? This week, our editor, Alex, who has been working from home, had the chance to sit down with Josh Michaels of Riverview Church. Riverview, like many churches, has had to transition their in-person services to now be online. And I have to say, they've done a pretty tremendous job given the short amount of time they've had to build this entire infrastructure and really get this off the ground. So during their conversation, you're gonna hear Josh talk about how his team has made this transition and how they're gearing up to make their Easter service just as meaningful as it would be if they were doing it in person. I think there's a lot of great tips your organization is gonna be able to take away uh, should you be interested in doing virtual events and wanting to make that still feel like a personal experience. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into their conversation. Hey Josh, what's going on? Not much, uh, just staying pretty busy this week, to be honest, but it's going well. The uh, weather this week with the sun we've had has been very nice to have. Absolutely. So um, just to clue some people in, in what you do, um, can you tell me a little bit about what you're in charge of, what your responsibilities are at Riverview? Yeah, for sure. So my role is the creative and communications director. And so broadly, if you see it, read it, touch it, my team has a hand in it at Riv um, across all our venues in Lansing. And so uh, more practically, it looks like uh, the videos we put out, graphic design, set design on stages, um, anything print, all our books, social media, communication, um, and in the last couple of weeks, uh, PR for how to deal with a pandemic. So um, yeah, there's a lot going on, but it's a fun fun spot to be. Yeah, so you're, you're typically making things both online, kind of social uh, content, but a lot of what you make is for the weekend service um, when it's kind of the embodied gathering event. What has it been like to try to shift those same things, but into this online experience instead. Yeah, it's been weird <laughs> to put it in one word. Um, I think that's kind of, I feel like the pulse everyone has right now, you talk to someone and they just say, yeah, things are weird. Um, so the first two weekends um, of everything really hitting here in Michigan, we moved our services to online, but they were still happening live on stage and so for that um, we don't normally stream services so we brought in um, cameras and set up that whole process to live switch and everything but as far as the service itself it was largely the same just with no people in the room and so that was um, for myself and for my team a pretty easy transition um, definitely some scrambling getting that set up in between thursday and the weekend but we were able to do it, uh, did those two services. And then when we moved to the uh, stay home world we're in now, it was kind of again reinventing, okay, how do we even put a service together when not only can we not gather, but staff and pastors and volunteers can't gather to physically just film it. And so that was just figuring out how do we record that and put it together um, and still put together a meaningful service without seeing each other. Um, yeah, I imagine um, you have like a lot of volunteers that help out too and that condensing all of those onto in the online service platform, I'm sure that added just a ton of very specifically skilled work too that you couldn't lean on a lot of other people. So I'm sure that meant just a lot of hunkering down late nights, getting stuff around. Right, yeah, it's been um, 
tech director, myself, and then um, our music team really uh, pulling out everything to get to get it done. So, yeah, yeah, because yeah, typically a weekend service, um, our staff is largely we get things ready to go, but then volunteers are in the booth running slides, mm -hmm. running sound, um, the band, they know what they're doing. And so it's very much weekend services are volunteer heavy and volunteer forward. Um, but without that and just wanting to be really safe and above bar and making sure we're doing things uh, wise and at a distance, um, just leaning into the skilled staff that we have. Yeah. So shifting a little bit just into kind of the purpose of a weekend gathering, can you tell me just general before the stay at home order, um, what's kind of the hoped goal of someone who attends a weekend service just under normal circumstances? Yeah. Um, <laughs> why to come to church? Uh, great question. <laughs> No, I mean, I think um, as a church, we say our mission statement is to proclaim the liberating power of the gospel as we, as we grow, serve, and go. And so um, we believe that with the gospel message, there's freedom from um, just the craziness and the mess of life um, and just the struggle that we all have. And then we want to just convey that message of Jesus and of the gospel to people. And so... The weekend service is really a space um, for people to hear that message, whether for the first time or they need to keep hearing that and keep reminding themselves of that. Um, but also a space to gather as a church family and a church community. Um, I was talking to a friend recently and he said, you're really in the business of people gathering and you can't do your business. And I was like, I mean, I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's very much the case is being the church is being unified and being a body and having that communal nature of um, rubbing shoulders, checking in, how are you, um, looking out for people that need help um, while also centering your lives um, personally and as a community on the gospel. So I hope that somewhat answered your question. Yeah, so then <laughs> um, without being able to collectively gather in that embodied way, you're putting together this online experience that people can click into, watch. How do you still achieve or try to achieve those same goals of like making it a communal experience, even when it's digitally served? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been tough. Uh, so what we've been doing is we stream our service uh, 10 a.m. Sunday morning and really encouraging people to um, pull the video up, join, whether it's um, with their family in a living room, by themselves, with their roommates, wherever they are, to really like gather at that one point. They can stream it the rest of the day, rest of the week, but we just see value in knowing that Riverview as a church, like across Lansing and wherever else, are all gathered at one time uh, listening to music, singing along to music, listening to the message uh, collectively. And so as far as trying to have that community aspect, um, even little ways of just like above and beyond interacting with people on Instagram. Um, it feels silly, but like engaging with them from church to user, they see like, oh, I'm a part of something that's happening right now. I can share a picture of my living room and then Riv sees it, they're sharing it. Um, just little pieces of community like that. And then within the service itself, we're really trying to include people from across um, all of Riverview, all our venues. And so one aspect we have in our service currently is a scripture reading. And so we've been uh, just tapping volunteers to use their phone and read a scripture passage and then we play that in the service. And so it's a chance for them to step up and be involved in the service, but then also people from their venue to be like, oh, hey, Nikki was on screen and I know her. I like bumped into her at service a couple weeks ago. Um, and so just trying to make those like human touches and still involving as many people as we can, even though it's a kind of centralized video service. Yeah, tell me about, um 
in trying to involve that many people with the order to stay at home it's like obviously that's a very clear constraint how have you guys just thought about trying to like solve those problems um and the mix between like having people shoot things on their phone but then also mixing in quality cameras to shoot things quality audio recording for clarity like what is that kind of sliding scale of fitting within these constraints but also producing something that isn't just holding up your iPhone for 20 minutes. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, we live in a weird world where everyone has a really nice camera in their pocket all the time. And so leaning into that as we can has been awesome. And so for the most part, you could call anyone in your contact list and say, hey, can you film a video of this and send it to me? And they're going to be able to. So that's been awesome just to have that opportunity um, but also still trying to have as you were saying like quality audio quality video uh, to mix in and still have um, just a clean service as people are viewing it and so one of the little things we did was um, on the front end of all this got some audio recorders that all our venue directors um, or pastors can have themselves and so as they're recording video from their homes they can just fire that up and get good audio, um, set up their phone, record them, and then on the editing side, we just throw it together. And so that's typically where I would be running almost all of the shoots, setting up camera, setting up audio. They just walk in and do their speaking. They're able to do kind of my job by themselves, which is a weird spot, um, but helps us with getting that clear audio. and. I mean, this week I've been actually doing a ton of like FaceTime video chat, how to set up a camera, uh, which has been <laughs> like an actual bizarre, camera, an actual camera. Yeah. So whether someone has it themselves or um, we have a few camera rigs that we've been um, passing around, like we'll sanitize them, drop it off at someone's porch. They pick it up and they have no idea what it is. It's like, well, here's a case and here's a bag and a tripod. Um, it's all cleaned and then they FaceTime me and say, okay, how do I set up a camera? Right. Um, which is fun. It's like to talk through that. Um, but also some people have no concept of the production backend side of gear. Mm -hmm. Um, and so even little things of like, okay, on the tripod at the very bottom, there's a knob, spin that to the left and that will open up and then push the legs out and then spin it to the right and it locks. Step one um, complete. <laughs> right. So like things that uh, you and I being so deep in this field, yeah. it's just second nature and we can set up a shoot in 20 minutes. Um, for a lot of people, it's gear is completely foreign. And so yeah. just talking them through all those steps and then um, like for Easter weekend, we did that for the whole band. And so someone who is a talented musician doesn't necessarily know how to do a camera. So I talk them through all the setup. You plug in this XLR, get the microphone connected. Here's how you check levels, make sure you're recording. And then they get to actually sing the song um, and then pack up the gear, clean it up, sanitize it, and then on to the next. I guess why go through all that trouble then what is the value of trying to use that quality equipment, um, what does that add in the end product for people viewing? Yeah, um, good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, especially right now, we're all very accustomed to seeing just phone video, um, seeing, I mean, we're all on Zoom calls all day, it seems like, um, so we're used to that. Um, so leaning into that and acknowledging that, but also wanting something that's clean and polished that people can uh, respond to. Um, a lot of my job at Riv is to do things well and take things to a point so that kind of the platform that I help build visually and creatively can fade into the background and is, isn't a distraction for the message that's spoken from stage. Totally. And so I see the same thing in our current state with video. Um, 
yes, people are willing to accept lower quality video, but when it is just clean and polished and there's not like popping or staticky audio, it's one less thing to distract them from hearing what's happening on screen. Nice. Yeah, you mentioned this week being Easter, kind of. It's a weekend where a lot of people go to church. And so I imagine you try to pull out all the stops. You try to really be intentional of how you plan an Easter service year to year. Tell me about what that has been like this year with kind of short notice of knowing that Easter is still significant. People are still wanting to go to church, yet it's going to be in this online platform. What kind of um, problem solving did your team do to still like maintain the significance of the day, but like in this new format? Yeah. So yeah, Easter and Christmas. I mean, those are your <laughs> church holidays. Um, they're like people call it, it's like the Super Bowl of Christianity, whether you like that analogy or not. Uh, it's an analogy. Um, and so typically for Easter, and this year wasn't any different, it's a couple of months. So shortly after the first of the year, we're really planning for Easter um, as far as what we want the flow of the service to look like, uh, what the makeup of the band is, creative elements, um, all that, and then prepping it so that we can promote it, get people um, through the doors and have the Easter service. And so we're in that process of planning and then everything got shifted a month ago. And it's like, all right, well, we have like online service streamed from one of our venues, so it'll be similar. And then, so replanning our plan. And then again, with the stay home, had to replan the plan again. And so typically what's a couple months, um, like last week we are finalizing the details for how to do this service in this capacity. Um, there's some elements that we're able to carry on, but largely it was reinventing the wheel in 10 days as opposed to three months. Yeah, that that's wild. Um, <laughs> can you, just for reference, like, what do you think um, the video, video, like the full online duration, how long is that, that you're putting together each week? Um... 60 to 75 minutes, depending. Okay. Nice. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a chunk. It's a large video to put together weekly. Yeah. So typically, typically I'm not, we're not editing together a video every week. It might be every other week. And that might be like a three minute video. Um, and so to have an hour long deliverable every week is pretty wild. Yeah. So we were kind of talking about like um, what you hope just a, a weekend service would look like for someone coming through the doors. Um, for this Easter, what does success look like for someone who opens up their laptop, their phone, watches the service? What do you hope um, is the result? Yeah, I mean, um I think both for our, like the Riv family and everyone, like these are crazy times, can't get around that. Um, and it's getting crazier and we're still figuring out how to live our lives independently and collectively in light of that. And so having a regular weekend church service um, is like some sense of normalcy that people can have um, and just a hour hour 20 like to not forget about what's going on in the world but to be reminded of the hope that we have in light of what's going on in the world um and so i think that for me would be a goal um just so people are reminded that god is bigger than this and yeah this is an awful situation that we're going through that isn't going to change but there is something more than this and beyond this. Um, so yeah, I mean, and if people, even with online services, we've had people attend for the first time, which is crazy to me, but a really cool opportunity. And it's like, I don't know if there's people, there's people out there that may not step into the doors of a church, 
but they're willing to stream a service online to check it out and kind of like get their feet wet, if you will, Mm -hmm. um, in seeing what um, Christianity is about and seeing if they want to come to church. And so even just that would be really cool on Easter for people to check out a church or church service for the first time. Yeah. I think that's even, um, that purpose can be extended to all types of businesses and organizations too. It's like we were planning on this event, but now this is a really low barrier way for people to get the gist of our mission, of our services, of our like community. And I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say just to another church, another organization that like had all of their plans dashed by this, how would you encourage them if they're trying to pursue the same type of thing, putting together an online live video or a a different kind of experience than what was planned? Yeah. I mean, I think one thing I would say is just like, (laughs) Be realistic. You're not going to be able to do a one-to-one translation of what your plan was to what you can do online. Um, so don't try to do that because you're going to stress yourself out and get frustrated. Um, I think, yeah, I would encourage just doing something is going to be great. Um, like to churches in particular, I mean, we have the gospel message and it's a simple message. And if you communicate that, you've done your job. And yeah, you can pull out all the stops, bells and whistles, make a huge elaborate production. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about conveying a simple message that there's freedom and life beyond this. And if you can communicate that, if it's just your phone, opening up Facebook Live, reading the Bible in the corner of your house, someone's gonna open it up and hear what you have to say. And that's worth it. Awesome. Well, yeah, this has been enlightening. I just appreciate <laughs> you <laughs> talking about all the work that's going into this. Um, and I hope for your sake it doesn't last too much longer. But it's been um, really cool to see just how you and the team have pivoted several times now and um, are still trying to make this happen because it, it's purposeful and it's um just an important part of people's lives so if people want to connect with you with riverview um where can people follow yeah like and subscribe swipe up um (laughs) no yeah um pretty much anywhere just put in riv church um at slash you can find us our services are rivchurch.com slash stream uh sunday mornings at 10 a.m so yeah you want to check it out we'll be there yeah should be a good time (laughs) cool sweet thanks a lot josh yeah good chatting alex one of the things that alex and josh talk about is the technology component to all of this you know if you want to host a virtual event that's really going to drive impact you're gonna need more than just your smartphone to do it you need to be able to switch between different camera angles add in graphics or cue pre-roll video and that's exactly why we have our professional live streaming service so if your organization is interested in transitioning to virtual events and you want to figure out how you can pull that off in a way that feels personal and in impactful, much like the way that Josh and his team are doing it at Riverview. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Just head to coldboxfilms.com slash services. You'll see our professional live streaming service right there. And we'd love to have that conversation. Um, But I hope you took away some really great tips today from what Josh and his team is doing. We really appreciate his time and being on. And we'll see you guys next week for another quarantine conversation.